Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you Googled today? Show of hands today. Look around. Virtually everybody. Did anybody use another search engine in the past 24 hours, such as Yahoo, maybe, or Bing? Anyone at all? Yes, you, sir. What did you do? Did you Bing? You binged. Yeah, it doesn't even work as well as a word, verb, does it? No. But this little illustration it really works quite well because the world market share on internet search for Google is 89%. 89% of all queries asked on the internet goes through Google. So that's an amazing figure, and there are lots of amazing figures when it comes to looking at Google. Another one is the PPPS number. The PPPS unit is not very commonly used, and that's because I invented it. Uh, the PPPS number is the pure profit per second. Last time I checked for Google, 381 US dollars. That's the net profit per second. So they're making real money. But the most interesting figure of them all, I've saved for last, and that's 38,700. So what is that, 38,700? Well, that's how many Google queries we ask, we, the humanity, globally, every second. Check this out. That was about three seconds. So that was 100,000 questions to Google right there on everything. So what does that mean? Well, if you own that database, you're going to know a whole lot about humanity. You're going to know a whole lot about what we're curious about right now, what we're scared of, what we're looking to buy, what we're looking to sell. And I'm going to give you a few examples on how you can use this information if you have it. First example, American presidential election in 2008, Barack Obama versus John McCain. And Google decides to see if there's a correlation between how we Google and how we vote. Can that be done? Absolutely. You see, a Google query can easily be followed down to a street address. No problem at all. And the American electoral system is very much dependent on how each state votes. So the Americans go to vote. Google does their analysis. And they can see that in 49 states out of 50, the most Google candidate is also the winning candidate. 49 states out of 50, the most Google candidate is also that state's winner. So we learn two things. First of all, we learn that um, we po probably tend to Google positively in a political way. We tend to Google more for the candidate that we're more likely to vote for. But the second thing we learn, Google knew who was going to be president before the Americans went to vote. Example two is American as well. About the same time, the big pandemic spread across the continent. I believe it was the bird flu back in 2008. And Google decided to see can we follow how the flu is spreading across the continent based on how people Google? Absolutely. Go to yourselves. How do you behave with your health questions? You get a strange pain in your leg, you get this rash in your arm you can't recognize. You can talk to the doctor, and you're going to talk to the doctor, but not unless you've talked to Dr. Google first. Seriously, that's what we all do now. I've lectured to groups of doctors, of, of nurses. They're frustrated. People come into the office and they smack a stack of paper and go, Kreutzfeldt, Jakob's disease. <laughs> this is what we do. This guy I met here at the University of Lund, he said, well, I've just put in 11 semesters of hard work to become a medical doctor, and now I have the privilege and the honor to work at the hospital to give my patients a second opinion. <laughs> that's where we're at. So what do we do when we read in the paper about the big flu, the big pandemic, at the same time we get a little fever, we get that shiver breaking down our spine? Yeah, we're going to go Googling. We're going to go Googling for easily identifiable words like uh, vaccine, like flu symptoms, like shivers, like fever. No rocket science to figure those out. Google plots a map of the continent and decides to see, can we geographically see any sort of little peak in search terms that are flu related. Yes, we can, out on the coast. And a week goes by, and this little peak in flu related search terms has moved inland, passing Chicago, passing St. Louis, passing Denver, passing the Nevada desert, all the way out to the coast. Six weeks later, the statistic is there, the official statistic from the authorities, and it's right on the money. Except, of course, Google had it real time. And remember this little exercise we did in the beginning, this show of hands? I didn't mention 10 different search engines for you all and saw 10% hands on each. This is not an internet phenomenon. This is very Google-specific. 
just imagine what it's worth knowing that stuff if you own a vaccine factory. Now, Google doesn't sell it, but they have it, and they're the only ones who have it. And you know what? I'm even going to give you a third example to really hammer this one down. Those of you in this room are probably all very familiar with what the Eurovision Song Contest is. If you are watching from outside of Europe, you may not know what this is. I advise you to go Google the Eurovision Song Contest and read up a little. You're still not likely to understand, uh, but I suggest that you read up a little bit. Every year, most countries of Europe have a contest in pop song writing and performing, and we televise it. So once a year, we get together and have this big battle in deciding if Portugal or the Ukraine or Italy or any other nation is better at writing pop songs. This is very, very peculiar, but I never miss it. It's on in May every year. I've even covered it a few times. I'm a newspaper reporter, and back in 2010, I was at the Eurovision Song Contest in Oslo, Norway. It had gotten very big, about 40 countries competing, and it's gonna get, it was going to get really stressful on Saturday night because the contest is set late, and I'm not going to know until maybe five minutes before midnight who actually is the winner. And Sunday, obviously, is the big day for any subscribed newspapers. We have to roll the printing presses a quarter after midnight, or our subscribers are not going to get the paper in time. So you see, this leaves me with a bit of a problem. I got about 15 minutes to go from the press area into the arena, wrestle 2,000 colleagues from all over Europe, get myself to the front of the stage and get an accurate quote from a screaming winner who's probably saying something like, it's the best thing that ever happened to me, and then run back to the press area, write the story, ship it off to the newsroom where a colleague of mine has to make a page, get a headline in there, get a picture in there, get it out to the printing presses and all this in 15 minutes sharp. That's not going to happen. And I know that, of course. I need to figure out a way to take the stress out of this process. I need to talk to the winner before the contest. Good idea, good idea so far. How do I go about making that happen? Well, I go to YouTube, the world's largest television channel, owned by Google, acquired, I guess they paid about $1.65 billion back in 2007, and I think that was a cheap deal. Today, there's another 72 hours of film uploaded there every minute. I kid you not, three full days every minute. So it's a lot of data. What we can see there matters. I look at all the songs, I look at all the entries in the Eurovision Song Contest, and I can see clearly that the German entry, Satellite, by Lena May Landrut, has the most views, most popular on YouTube by far. I then move on to Google Trends, which is a small analytical tool that we all can use, not super sophisticated, but you can learn some things there. I seem to find a clear German trend there, too. And to speak in poker terms, I decide to go all in on this information. Wednesday comes, and I'm able to briefly catch the German artist at this mingly reception thing, and I, I sneak up on her, and I introduce myself, and I say, hey, I'm from a Swedish newspaper, and uh, you've just won the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> How does it feel? And she looks at me funny, kind of like, should I call security, or should I answer questions from this guy? <laughs> and she decides to talk to me, and she says, what? Well, I got, I got these stats, and I'm telling her, see, check this out, check this out. And she says, no, come on. Come on, that's not the same thing as me winning the Eurovision Song Contest. That's me being popular on the internet. That's me maybe having a lot of young fans who like to share my stuff. But that's not the same thing as them calling in on Saturday and actually voting for me. And it's my turn to say, you know what? It is, though. It is the same thing. Because in every nation around the world, we have different sort of polling institutes. And a week before the general elections, they will make phone calls to about 1,500 people, and they will get the result right, very close to right, maybe a percent off, maybe 2% off, but they get it right in 1,500 phone calls. These guys, they have 38,700 queries per second on everything, in every language from around the world all the time to base their stats on. So unless you forget to go out on stage on Saturday when it's your turn and the music is playing, yes, you have, in fact, won the Eurovision Song Contest, how does it feel? <laughs> and she's so cool. She's about 20, 21 at the time, big favorite, catchy song, everybody thinks she's gonna win. She just kinda looks at me funny, she says, well, I guess it's the best thing that ever happened to me then. <laughs> Which, of course, to say, it's a lovely quote, 
and I retire to my quarters. Saturday comes by, I write my story, and in the moment, it's all said and done Saturday night, and she is, in fact, the winner of the Eurovision Song Contest. I press send on my article. And at home in the newsroom, there's a couple of colleagues that goes, by golly, he was fast tonight. <laughs> and that's what I did there is totally not cool, by the way. You can't save a quote from another occasion and pretend it's from some other time. Totally not ethical. Don't do it. Don't tell anyone I did. But I did this one time because I knew that it would work. It's too much data. It's way too much data. And I think you agree with me now when you've heard these three examples that when I say that the most interesting information transaction does not travel from Google to us, when we Google, it travels from us to Google. So what does that mean? Well, Google, they don't like to talk about this very much. Or if they do, they like to talk about it in funny terms. Uh, like they will say things like, well, we have the yearly statistics now, and we can see that there's been a lot of Googlings on cupcakes this year. Last year was more of a muffin year, so we obviously have a cupcake trend in society. Thanks. I love a good cupcake, but this is not about cupcakes. It's about owning a database that has no equivalent anywhere else. That's what it's about. And let me just point out, that what you heard me say so far is not a sign of anti-Googleism or anti-corporatism or anti-Americanism or anti-anything at allism. It's journalism. It's merely a necessary reflection on a reality that we as internet users have made together. And as a reporter, I enjoy asking the occasional difficult questions sometimes, not knowing where the answer is, such as, what if the principles that guide Google's behavior with our data were to change? I'm asking you to look at this macro, to look at the big picture, and translate what you've learned into terms of indexed knowledge and money. You'll see a power player that the world has just not ever seen before. It would be terribly irresponsible to not stay informed. This is a perspective, ladies and gentlemen, that we just seem to forget. Thank you very much.